And the next speaker is, uh, probably doesn't need much introduction, is Dr. Adetun Mustafa. I'm sure many, many of us know Adetun. Um, she works in the en energy industry in Nigeria on the Sustainable Development Goal 7, Affordable um, and Clean Energy, which is also a bunch of energy herself. But, um, wherever she comes, I mean, she's the light in the room. And uh, also, she's a very active member of the IEC, she leads the Africa chapter, um, and also is a member of the Ethics and Philosophy Committee. Um, she has a very diverse interest, uh, including health effects of air pollution, waste management, uh, climate change, green space, you name it, she does it. Um, and I think she represents the whole of Africa and does most of the work in Africa at the moment. And what we're going to hear a little bit of what is actually going on in Africa. Adetun, please, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, listening to the deputy mayor and uh, my duty will agree with me that there is substantial disease body and economic impact of environmental stressors on public health in Africa. But despite this, you find out that significant environmental health gaps still exist about Africa when you look at the literature. So having a conference that is looking at the history of environmental epidemiology and the future of it is an opportunity for every one of us to begin to look at how we will influence policies and the global research agenda to be more accommodating of developing country needs. So that things that maybe are no longer issues in developed country but are still major issues in Africa will be funded and we will have an improvement. That in our generation, we will change the narrative of Africa. Before I move into that, this year actually marks my 28th year of joining ICU. In 1999, as a student, MPH student in Cardiff in the UK, I came across a textbook on environmental epidemiology by uh, John Goldsmith. And that was the first time I had the word environmental epidemiology. And I was fascinated with a discipline that integrates environmental health. So I took lead from that book to search out ISE on the internet. And it was the time they were calling for abstracts for the conference in Greece. I submitted an abstract on environmental pollution in Niger Delta of Nigeria. And somebody, one of the members, Elliot reached out from the Ethics and Philosophy Committee, walked into my uh, poster session and invited me to the Ethics and Philosophy Committee meeting. And that was the beginning of a relationship which by faith upon and 20 years, I'm here standing talking to you. I'm really grateful to so everyone that has contributed to my development. IAC has played a significant role because it is an IAC conference in Munich. I met my PhD supervisor, David Briggs, and I've had the opportunity to serve in various committees of IAC. It has provided a network of support for me around the world. So IAC has played a significant role in my career, in my professional de development, and I'm grateful to everyone. I hope so many people whose names I won't be able to mention, you can see your name in the, in the word cloud. Thank you very much. So it is important for me to show the map of Africa. Some people will be asking why am I doing this? Years ago in the UK, as a student, people will walk up to me and say, oh, you, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Nigeria in Africa. I say, oh, did you know my friend, Mr. John <laughs> from Kenya? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm from West Africa, there's no way I know Mr. John from Kenya. <laughs> so please, Africa is made of 54 countries. <laughs> so in West Africa, we don't speak Swahili, so don't tell me Akona Matata. <laughs> so East Africa speaks Swahili more. So it's one, it's one of the population that is projected to take the lead by 2050. It's a population that is increasing rapidly and it has the youngest population in the world. But 20% of the world youth are actually residents in Africa. So Africa has people between age 15 to 24 that's about 223 million. And this is projected to increase to double by 2050. So we have a population of youth which will also can be 
a challenge and also an opportunity. Of course, a lot of people know Africa. They tell you they want to look at uh, wildlife. You come to Africa, yes. It's two of the, it's home to two and uh, nine biodiversity hotspots and also five of the world wilderness to are residents in Africa. But Africa is highly diverse, even within country. I'm glad you saw the what uh, Majid show. Within Accra, you can see the inequality. The same happened in Africa. 18 of the countries in Africa are currently undergoing either war, they are fragile out of the 54. So you have, Africa is a continent where you have the rich live side by side with the poor. So like light and day, they live together. We need to change that narrative. So please, let's think of what we can do. How does the health indicator play? With all the effort on immunization and improvement in public health, the health indicator that you see for on the fives has improved starting from the 1990s. A study compared between 1990 and 1985 to what we currently have now. Between, as at 2015, the average life expectancy now is about 60 years in most countries in Africa. And infant mortality has now dropped to around 100 per thousand parts. You still have few countries that has around 96, but a country like Egypt, between, 2000, between 1985 and 2015, the infant mortality ratio in Egypt reduced from greater than 100 per thousand parts to about 19 per thousand parts. So you have across Africa, things have improved. So, but Africa is undergoing an epidemiology transition. We are moving from not just infectious diseases, communicable diseases, also to non-communicable diseases. Obesity, diabetes, those are major issues now. Asthma and things related to respiratory health. Environmental risk factor actually account for about 23% of all the disease burden in the region. So environment play a major role. In it. So how do we fare in terms of our economy? Africa, almost every country in Africa has one mineral resource or something they put. It's a very blessed country, uh, continent. But the challenge with that also is that years ago, one gen some generation, they mortgaged the future of other. In Africa, a lot of countries have accommodated public debt, and they are spending a lot of their revenue to service debt. In West Africa, as high as 17% of the revenue are used to service debt. In Ghana, it's around 40%. In Nigeria, it's 50%. So even though they are rich in mineral resources, they sell oil, coffee, gold, and everything, but the money is being used to pay debt, and they have very little for public health. The other thing is also the way some countries in Africa are accommodating them. And why this is important is that sometimes the payment terms are very stringent and the future of unborn generations have been signed out for benefits many of them will never get. Also, when we look at the growth external debt to GDP ratio, it's very high. In a country like Cape, Cape Verde, it's around 103%, while in some, it is low. So, Africa rich in economy, rich in terms of mineral resources, but the external debt is a burden on the continent. In terms of its research, how do we fare? Less than 1% of the GDP goes into research. And you can imagine the amount that even gets into environmental health research. In most parts of Africa, in some, there is almost like a stigmatization and selective inequality, even in the way health funds are distributed. Environmental health seems to get the least, while, communicable, uh, while infectious diseases, HIV, and what, tends to get small. And for a continent that is a candidate for sustainable development, we are 23% of 
the uh, body, disease body, is caused by environmental risk factor. That is something we really need to change. In terms of research paper, the data is there for many of you have read if you've ever worked in. Many countries, and for me, that was there are many countries that less than 100 papers are published. We are not, forget the quality of the paper, that is another thing. But even when you just look at the numbers, some of the numbers are very, very minimal. Only three countries, South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya, when you look at the number of papers, account for 52% of paper published around 2020 to 2015. And while, but when you normalize for GDP, you have countries like Gambia, Malawi, and guinea bissau doing that. I had a chat with some of the editors of the journals, Epidemiology, Environmental Epidemiology, and the EHP. And one of the other things to also look at is, uh, what is African representation in some of the, among reviewers of the journal? In some cases, it is zero. In some cases, you have three, two, five, and the water. Essentially, there is a low representation of having African voice in the room when you're talking of even the research. And also, Africa papers from Africa tend to have a high rejection rate. And some of the reasons are actually due to design errors. In terms of infrastructure and energy, how do we fare? Most parts of Africa have huge infrastructural deficits. Energy access in most parts of uh, in Africa generally, according to World Bank, is less than 37%. So, in most parts, in the country where I come from, Nigeria, only about 40% have access to electricity provided by the by governments. So you have still have part of the of the country that are not connected to the grid. Also, capital spending on infrastructure are very low. And when you talk about digital divide, it's even more prominent in Africa the cost of internet is very high. And of course, many, many countries don't even have broadband yet. So what are the challenges we have? Sanitation, modern sanitation. Uh, uh, my did mention modern sanitation in Europe. But things like water, hygiene, and sanitation are still a huge problem in Africa. Which, uh, Africa has a higher exposure so all the indicators of hygiene, sanitation, and water, and solid fuel use compared to other parts of the world. And we have less access to water. It is not just the quality of water, even having water at all, it is. Those photos you see there, they are real photos from Nigeria. <coughs> this is a picture of a village in Oyo State. This stream is where people actually, they wash there, they take water there, and they use the water for cooking. So they are real life picture. So things that you don't see elsewhere, you still have all that inequality in Africa. In terms of population growth, I mentioned earlier that it's, Africa is one of the fastest uh, parts of the world that is experiencing major population shifts. And that comes with a lot of challenges. That means, People are going to be, more people are going to be drying up on limited resources. And that is creating a lot of inequalities, even within the urban centers. You have a high number of urban slums in major cities in Africa. And that is a real life. The middle picture there is the kind of people in urban area will do, will live. A typical city, you can see this, Go to Accra, go to Lagos, you will see things like this in every part of Africa. This is also a real life picture. These are urban areas where you can see sanitation is a major issue in most parts of the continent. Air pollution. Air pollution, Af Africa contributes about 1 million to the 7 million WHO published as resulting death resulting from hair pollution. Some of our traditional way of life actually are very dirty. When you look at this, this is the traditional way of smoking fish. So you have 
a metal container, you have wood under, then the fish is placed on it, then you cover it. Those are the commercial way they do smoke fish. This is open burning. A large percentage of waste are destroyed by open burning. And this is almost 8 in 10 of buses like this in Nigeria. They are old and you will see fumes coming from them. How do we fear in terms of hazardous waste? Despite the Basel Convention, a lot of waste, electronic waste, are still being shipped to Africa illegally. And Ghana and Nigeria has ranked as one of the places that you will find this happening in alarming rates. So, modern environmental health hazard has become an issue in Africa and also because of malaria control. Countries like Mauritius, they will fumigate their ports, but this in itself, using DDT for malaria control, also pollutes the ecosystem and then creates additional health hazards around. So you have release of uh, endocrine disruptors are now prevalent in Africa, and it is an area of challenge. Artisan mining, illegal mining, funded by people in developed countries, it's prevalent in Africa, and it has, is introducing any dynamics into the environmental health challenges. Climate change. Africa is the least contributor to emission, but it's one of the most, it's the most vulnerable than other places. Weak health system, emergency preparedness response is very weak. And a lot, most of the, of the population depend on climate sensitive agriculture for livelihood. So once there is general change in weather pattern, rainfall, it affects livelihood and increases poverty and creates food insecurity and all. So climate change is going to be a, is a major issue already for us in Africa. So, and the challenge is that even some of the gains already achieved in reducing poverty with climate change, that would, might be something that might be lost. Research and data gap. Few places in the world will you find people still going to clinic and they will ask you, where is your card? So to go to see an optician, you have to have a card, manual. So health system in Africa, the data and the research data, they are still very manual. Even when you have some, I was discussing with a colleague yesterday, I said, even when you have some in electronic format, in electronic format, within country, there's, it is inconsistent that the amount of work you need to do to clean up the data. So it's uh, one of the challenges of doing research in Africa is that you don't even have the data easily accessible in the way you can use it. And don't forget, I've talked about internet and electricity problem when you are in the field collecting data, that could be a major challenge. Also, it's also slow translating some of, even when you do research, translating them into things that will improve public health because there's a lot of risk normalization. People are not aware that it is bad to actually be cooking and having smoke and be inhaling smoke. Because traditionally, you cook like that, your fish, that is how you smoke your fish. So when somebody now comes up and says this, it takes a lot of education before people are actually convinced that this is not something I should engage in. So what are the opportunities? Indeed, these are challenges, but it also comes with opportunity. As a research community, this is an opportunity to actually develop and test robust methods. Here are places where you have complex risk factors, multiple risk factors and complex ones that we can actually find through our research methodology on how to do things. And also, this is an opportunity to understand more group level determinants of health. And actually, Africa is a place where the concept of planetary health can actually be studied and be, and information from there used to improve uh, policies. Technology 
will play a key role in Africa going forward. The advent of smartphone and social media has helped in people actually getting more information about health, threats, and WhatsApp. So with technology, information, big data, and those are opportunities also that can open door for environmental epidemiology research to fill the data gap that is currently in, in the continent. In the UK, one of the things that intrigued me is how collaboration within the EU has enabled people to actually standardize research methodology and do a multi-country study. In Africa, that is one area where we need help. That we can have, even when you have papers on air pollution and respiratory health, if you take 10 papers from Africa, you will not be able to synthesize the regional perspective because the methodologies are different, things, how people do things are different. So, still developing standard protocol study design and methodologies for application across the continent is something we need. And there's opportunity for research collaboration to the scale and the magnitude of the environmental health problems we have. Also, one of the ways things change is when people can see what is done elsewhere. And the indicators, once we have a more research collaboration with Africa, some of these indicators can now bring things more to the policymakers that we need to change the way we do things. Africa is on the trajectory of industrialization, and this is an opportunity to actually do that on the basis of low carbon. We don't have to start our industrialization where the other countries are moving away from. We, we can do that on this, and this is one of the opportunities that we do. And finally, going beyond the interventions, we're actually looking at how the intervention translate to policy and how it changes life is one of the ways that will also help to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So what are the key research needs in Africa generally? One is human health effect of hair lunch, water, water pollution and urbanization. These are areas where we have significant data gap. If we don't have a country in Africa, where the government sponsor monitoring of air quality on continuous basis. There is none of the country that does that. That government funded and do that. Except you have a date, somebody's doing the projects and you say that. So the extent to which environmental factors contribute to increases non-communicable disease. One of the challenges you now have, the epidemiology transition in Africa. Type 2 diabetes is growing in Africa faster than any part of the world. Obesity is a major issue. For a population that will take the significant part of the future of the world, it is important that we begin to look at this. If you look at cold studies, there are not many African cold studies. And this is an area where we also need to begin to look at that what are the things we can do to help. Climate change and health, I'm not going to talk about that. But a critical one is the data that will link environmental health to development issues. So that things can move away from just being studied to also how it impacts life. So if you are here wondering, how can I do this? ISC has provided a platform to do this. Last year, the IAC Africa chapter was inaugurated. So um, our mission is to strengthen environmental epidemiology research in Africa. So as a member of IAC, we welcome collaborators and mentors. David Briggs gave me a chance and supported me to overcome a lot of challenges with collecting original data in Africa. I believe many of us here can give somebody in Africa a chance and can influence the discussion to ensure that Africa is part of the discussion where research agendas and priorities and funding have been discussed. So please, we welcome mentors in the ISC Africa chapters. If you can only coach and guide people, that would be welcome. The chapter is open to people who might not be 
citizens of Africa but are working in Africa. We welcome them as mentors. So in conclusion for me, environmental epidemiology is a public good. But we also need to be sure that every part of the world is represented in the agenda. We really need to look at how the funding, global research fund, how it is distributed to be sure that where you have the public health challenges, they also get significant amounts of the fund for the global health, public health research. Half of the expected population growth is going to come from Africa by 2015. So it is important that we have clearer understanding of the nature and magnitude of environmental health risk in Africa, if indeed we want to improve global public health. And this is now time for all of us as a research community to commit to take firm actions within our sphere of influence. To say, what will I do to change this narrative that when 10 years from now, when we are talking about Africa, the story will not be like this, but it will be going to what what we see in Utrecht. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aditi, for bringing the African perspective to this meeting, to describing the challenges and opportunities, and also thank you for all the work that you've been doing for the uh, African chapter.